This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 239, recorded on June 28th, 2013. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello and you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Have I not spoken with you in a while? It just seems... It, it has been a while. You were you were doing TWIVs elsewhere, and then I missed uh, last week because oh, I was great. sitting around in waiting rooms, and uh, yeah. Well, welcome back. Yeah, good to be back. Yeah, good to have you. Good to have the crew together. Also joining us today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. There, everybody. How are you? Hey, what happened? You got the Sunday evening radio voice. Oh, I do? <laughs> now, you're just quieter than usual. Uh, yeah. Usually well, okay. you're very enthusiastic. Everything okay? Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, everything's as, uh, it's better than okay. I'm not even coming to you from North Central Florida. You're not? I'm coming to you from Northeastern Florida, St. Augustine to be exact. Are you sailing again? I am. I'm not actually on the boat right now, but as soon as I'm done with this, I will be. Are we holding you up? Nope. You could do a twiv from a sailboat. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, the wireless might be a little flaky. Yeah, yeah okay. bandwidth would be a problem. And we get not, <laughs> when you got knocked in the water, that would be tough. Actually, I got Skype on my cell phone. So, you know, and we get pretty good cell phone reception. So we could try that sometime. You get, you can, oh, that's right. Your, your cell phones are from satellite, so you can go offshore. <laughs> no, so cell we're gonna, phones, oh, cell wait, phones wait. are land based. You, you lose cell phones about, about a mile or two offshore. Actually, they're land based. They're towers. Yeah. A mile or so, two? Hmm. So you yeah, don't go more than a mile or two offshore. I can get it out to three or four miles, I think. You know? Oh, okay. But at any rate, um, yeah, we'll take off and sail overnight down to New Smyrna Beach. Cool. Cool. Hang out also, sail back. also joining us today from microbiology and immunology at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, Matt Freeman. Hello, guys. Pleasure to be here. How's your sailboat? Uh, yeah, I'm not in that uh, that uh, <laughs> <laughs> the pay bracket yet to have the uh, sailboat in the yeah. harbor. Well, once you're a full professor, you can have a couple of sailboats. Sure. I'll have all pr- plenty of time, right? Yeah. In fact, NIH will pay the indirects on them. Right. Yeah, you, don't, grant. you don't. Well, need all to you have, have to do is do what Craig Venter does and right. and take some ocean samples with it, and and then you can call the boat an expense for the lab. I'll do some sea viruses. I like yeah. that. You don't actually need to have a boat. The better deal is to know somebody who has a boat. Yes, that's and be a good crew. Yeah, yeah. Well, isn't that the story? The best two days of a owner, a boat owner's life, is the day you buy the boat and the day you sell the boat. The day you sell it. <laughs> all right, Matt. You have the. Uh, honor as we discussed in the pre-show of being the the, the guest uh, the most times on twiv i am quite honored that's great i wonder what that means i, I think it means i replied yes to your emails the most <laughs> i think i ask you more than so he's people. the what the steve martin of our of twiv <laughs> i like I, that i don't get it tell me he's he's uh isn't he the most uh most frequent snl host in the right. show's history oh, yeah. or something exactly yeah. So TWIV is Saturday Night Live? Yes, that's, that would be the analogy. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The virology Saturday Night Live version. Except that it's Friday afternoon taped, which yeah. doesn't sound as good. Yeah. This af- Friday afternoons in virology. Oh, yeah. Doesn't seem to be. If, in case anyone's wondering, today it's 28 degrees in New York City, 60% humidity. Uh, it's partly cloudy, and the winds are out of the south at 12 miles an hour. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's it's 26 C here in Western Mass, and it is 79 percent humidity. We're having we're having tropical rainforest weather all week. I got gotcha. you. Uh, 81 Fahrenheit, 84 percent humidity. Ooh. We just had a thunder shower blow through. Wow, you're gonna so. have fun out there, aren't you? Oh yeah. Cool. Actually, actually, it's pretty good. Actually, it's pretty good weather. Well, we may get rained on a couple of times, but uh, it'll be a pretty good pretty good ride. And Matt, what's it like down there? So we have 84 degrees Fahrenheit, 69, uh, 60% humidity. It's nice and sticky summer day in Baltimore. Nice. All right. So the reason we have Matt on today 
well, whenever we have you, it's to do coronavirus stuff. Sure. You're the world's expert. I, don't, I will definitely not go that far at all. I work on <laughs> coronaviruses. That's as far as I'll go. Your, your, your colleagues would get pissed off, right, if you agree Yeah, we're that. not going to say that at all. If you had said, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I happen to work on the virus that's called a coronavirus. That's about it. Well, you are an expert, obviously. You know more about it than 99.99% of the people in the world. <laughs> Okay. And we want to hear all about the MERS coronavirus. This is the virus that won't go away. Yeah, you, uh, you're you not <laughs> picking it up as a, as a big uh, outbreak virus, from what I understand. How many cases do we have so far? 100? So there's 81 cases. Uh-huh. Um, I think we're up to 41 or 42 deaths today, as of today. So, um, okay. I'm looking at your article here, so your, your numbers are off. Well, that was I submitted that article a couple of weeks ago. It's <laughs> Time passed. <laughs> yeah, it's not. I mean, I just don't see it going anywhere. But let's talk about it. Sure. Um, t- can you tell us how it all began? Sure. So, um, so the virus is now called the MERS coronavirus, which stands for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus. Um, it is a coronavirus in the same family as the SARS coronavirus, which everyone generally knows about, that emerged in 2003. This virus emerged in 2012. Um, The first report of it was in September of 2012. Uh, And retrospectively, there was a case identified in April 2012. That was the first identified case. Um, In the press, it's always called a SARS-like coronavirus, which really isn't true. It's a a coronavirus in the same family as SARS. Um, I would say maybe a cousin of SARS. What's the d- percent of uh, nucleotide identity? Oh, I knew you were going to ask that. I don't know. It's not, it's, I mean, it, it has the same genome structure as yeah. all the other coronaviruses, um, but it's definitely in a, a different sub, it's in a subgroup of, of SARS. It's not, a, it's not a variant of SARS. There's no way you could call it that. It's definitely mm-hmm. a different virus altogether. Are all the genes um, the same or are there some unique genes in the MERS? Uh, so there, general, there, there are unique genes in MERS. So most coronaviruses have... Um, so the, the coronaviruses are 30,000 base pair uh, nidoviruses. Um, they're the largest RNA viruses. Um, negative, negative sense RNA. Positive sense RNA. Oops. Ah. Oh. Positive, positive sense strand, RNA. Yes. Right. I, that's a, what I meant to say. We have a positive strand meeting, which we just had a, a keystone meeting for uh, in um, May in Boston. Um, Enveloped. It's the, the nidoviruses are the largest RNA viruses, so the genome is around 30,000 bases. And the reason they get so big, uh, theoretically, is um, that they encode a proofreading activity in their uh, an exonuclease as part of the replicase proteins, um, which allows it to get so big. And if you mutate the, re- the, this exonuclease activity, you actually get a much, uh, a much higher mut- uh, mutagenesis phenotype in the, those viruses when you pass them so with Either this with this um exo right does it does the mutation rate approach that say of a dna virus so that it's actually interesting it's 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 quoted as saying in most uh articles or most manuscripts is saying that the rna all rna viruses are the same that mm-hmm. they all have a very high mutation rate of 10 to the 6 10 to the 7th um or 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 4 mutations per um kb and um or my sorry, minus three, minus four. Um, but in actuality, it's much lower than that. It's probably you know two to three logs lower um, mutation rate. So um, hmm. it's a you know I think I don't know if it's approaching the DNA viruses, but it's it's much much higher fidelity than was previously identified before. And this was all work done by Mark Dennison um, and Ralph Barrick. Uh, Mark's at uh, at Vanderbilt, and Ralph's at uh, at UNC. Okay. Um, and really, Mark has been the push on this side of it. And, and it was all really identified for that story by deep sequencing. So looking actually at the viral genomes uh, rather than consensus, but looking at, at individual viral genomes and, and swarms of virus and how they shifted over time in this XON mutant. I think we did that paper. In yes, we did. With Wilder, right. right? Yeah. Um, and so, and so anyway, the, the MERS is a coronavirus um, of this family, and the initial cases... Um, Hang on, the question was, does MERS have genes that are oh, sorry. unique to MERS and different than SARS? Yes, so uh, out of the 30,000 bases of the genome, the first 20 KB of, all, of generally all coronaviruses um, encode replicase proteins. 
So they're called NSPs or non-structural proteins. Uh, all of those are generally similar between all the coronaviruses. You can pretty much pick out by homology, by sequence homology, which are which across the NSPs. Um, the 3 prime 10 KB of the genome uh, encodes the structural proteins, the spike envelope membrane and nucleic acid protein. And those are, very, are again, similar between all the, prote- all the coronaviruses. They clearly are differences at the amino acid level and the base pair level, but they all have the same basic structure. Um, and interspersed in those structural proteins um, for all the coronaviruses are things that are called accessory proteins or group-specific proteins. And those proteins are unique to every coronavirus. And, and the do, idea, they have like, do they have like immunomodulatory function or something like that? Exactly. So okay. for SARS, we've, I worked on that for, for many years now, um, where we identified functions for several of the accessory proteins that uh, are interfering antagonists um, and affect the cell in a certain way. Um, uh, and we... And what people have, been, have shown across multiple coronaviruses is that if you delete those genes, the virus generally goes well or relatively well in culture. But when you can put those, those uh, deletion viruses into animals um, or other hosts, in another host, depending on if it's the natural host or the not unnatural host, you can tease out a pathogenesis phenotype. So they're not necessary for cell, for, for cell culture replication, but they're necessary for disease and pathogenesis. Um, so they're unique to every coronavirus, and, and MERS has four of these accessory proteins, which uh, are fairly unique to that one to that one type of virus. Mm-hmm. So you obtained this virus uh, some time ago, right? Right. So we, I think we probably got the isolate in in late December, early January. So, um, so you got virus or, or nucleic acid? We got virus at the time. And this was from the Erasmus isolate, right? This is the Erasmus isolate. Which was so the, let's let's tra- let's trace that back because uh, uh, you were telling us that it first appeared in like April 2012. And right. So there was one case in 2012, and and the case that really started it all was this case that was this reported in in, in September um, of last year, and uh, it was a case where um, uh, a patient in Saudi Arabia was identified as having. Um, a respiratory infection, just a general respiratory infection. And this uh, doctor in Saudi Arabia um, named uh, Dr. Ali Zaki, he was the, the, well, the ID doctor assigned to the case, and he went and took samples. And he, the story is that he put it, he, he tested those for all the known cr- viruses that he could, was normally tested for in their microbiology lab, and they turned up negative. Um, and so he then went to... Uh, he thought it might be a paramyxovirus potentially, and Ron Fouché at Erasmus um, had, in, had recently published a paper on um, assays for identifying novel paramyxos. Um, and in the process of Dr. Zaki sending samples to Dr. Fouché at Erasmus, the story goes that um, they said, well, why don't you check for coronaviruses, use these primers, and uh, it turned out that it was, did be, it, the samples were positive for coronas. Mm. And so... The sample that Ron uh, Fouché and the guys at Erasmus received, they then isolated the virus, sequenced it, and um, called it uh, HCOV for human coronavirus, uh, EMC for Erasmus Medical College. Right. And for taking the initiative and figuring out what the virus is, uh, Zaki was then fired, right? Right. (laughs) There seems to be other politics involved in this. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, (laughs) Uh, all that I really know is that he uh, went on vacation. He's Egyptian, and he went on vacation to Cairo, and now works in Cairo at a hospital. Yes. <laughs> yes. Huh. Um, so, okay, so you have, so you have um, from Erasmus. Then you got this this original virus, this isolate. We have the isolate, correct? And, you and have to, go ahead. there's there's one other um, kind of political wrinkle that came up a few weeks ago. Um, there was some be? some rumbling that uh, that Erasmus was not distributing the sample freely, and it somebody claimed that they had patented it, but it sounded like maybe it was just a material transfer agreement. Um, what's what's the deal with that? So I, I'm not a legal scholar. All I right. what I know is that there is an MT, there, there, there you can't patent the virus. Right. Um, you can put an MTA on the virus, and and the real I think the real purpose of the MTA was to make sure that everyone who got the isolate and who was sent the isolate to their lab 
uh, had approval from Erasmus so that they could track where their sample went. That right. was really the real purpose of, their, of the MTA. Right, because um, you're sending a respiratory virus around the world. You want to make sure you're not just mailing it out. Exactly. And not, oh. not just any old respiratory virus. Yeah, right. one that's one that's killing people. Yeah, right. right. And, 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 and the, MT, the MTA probably says that you, for example, can't just give this virus to somebody else. They have to get it from Erasmus or perhaps approval from you or something like that. So yeah, it absolutely. does leave a paper trail. Exactly. So we can't send the virus out to anyone unless Erasmus says we can. We have not sent the virus out to anyone. I send it. I always tell them just to talk to the guys, to Ron Fouché and Bart Hagman uh, at Erasmus, um, and. So the, the, that was really, I think, what the MTA was for. Associated with the MTA was um, uh, a ruling, you know, signing the MTA says that you can't use it, use the sequence of the virus or um, uh, for any development of a diagnostic uh, test based on the sequence. Um, so you can't take their isolate and then use it commercially to make your own um you know, real-time PCR or some kind of pro, right. uh, therapeutic at that level. Um, and I think that that the whole WHO um, uh, Minister of Health issue from the Saudi Arabia who got up to the WHO meeting and said that they patent the virus and this is causing all these problems is a bit overblown. Um, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I, then the, the thing that I do know, which is important, is that no, everyone who has asked Erasmus for the virus has got the virus if they have the right approval. So right. if you have a BL3, if the CDC says yes, if your, your EHS at university says, you know, gives you approval to have it, you pass the IBC, then you get the virus. Um, I don't know of anyone who has been blocked from publishing or from receiving the virus at all. So, you so what to, we have is pretty, pretty straight up typical MTA that yes. just protects the parties involved and that's what got blown up into that story. Well, exactly. and I think in, in particular in a case like this, having a, a, uh, knowing where this thing is is important. Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. And, 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 knowing, and knowing that it is the real thing, you know, keeping track of this is important. This is a BSL-3 pathogen, right? Yes, it is. Okay. So, so MT everything. MTA materials transfer agreement. Right. Correct. And these, are, these are common. Yes. Very common. Yeah. I mean, if we, if we send a, get a plasmid from a lab or we send the plas or some of our plasmids yeah. out to another lab of some random gene, we still have to sign, you know, make them sign an MTA. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, and it also, it also um, most of them have some kind of clause uh, protecting you from liability. R exactly. Which for right. a plasmid is not a big deal, but for a PSL3 virus, that's a pretty huge uh, uh, stipulation that's pretty important. Right. So, so you had to get CDC approval, uh, Institutional Biosafety Committee approval at the University of Maryland. Right. You had to sign the MTA, and all of that then went back to Erasmus, and then they gave it to you. Exactly. And how long did this whole thing take? Uh, I think the whole paperwork process only took two to three weeks. That's it really bad. went very fast. Oh, that's not bad at all. And how did it come to you? Like, uh, did a guy come in with a with a suitcase uh, <laughs> clipped to his wrist? You know, <laughs> right? The, the limousine showed up in the front with the old silver suitcase uh, handcuffed to his wrist. Right. No, um, <laughs> no, it, it we it was shipped on dry ice and in, in uh, vials, which were then sealed in um, in sealed plastic container, which was then in a screw top plastic container, sprayed down with disinfectant mm -hmm. inside a dry ice uh, freezer box. Yeah, so, multiple layers, basically. Well, yeah. So you definitely need multiple layers for all the shipments. There, yes. are, there are containers that are made for this purpose. And Correct. then when you got it, you brought it directly into the three? Is that how it works? Right. It went right into our three, um, into the freezer until we thought it to make our own stock. Cool. Neat. And then you've been working on it, obviously. Right. So initially, when the sequence was the, the the sequence of the virus was put on GenBank um, and on the internet in the fall, in when in September when this paper was published, and so we actually started synthesizing some genes at that point uh, before we even had the virus, so mm. we could start studying uh, these accessory proteins for their roles as uh, immune modulators. So you had mentioned once that this is going to be your SARS. Well, we're you know we're I think it's it, even if. At the time when we started looking at this, there was only a handful of cases. Um, and as just as a virology question, I think it's quite interesting that this virus is out again. Um, as it's got bigger and bigger and more cases, which we still don't really know what's going to happen with this at all, um, it's just become a much more interesting virus to work on um, for multiple reasons. For um, 
you know, hopefully everything we're going to talk about, but the way that the ability for it to cause disease, the genome, the where it comes from, you know, all of these things, we, there's really completely open questions that it leaves a lot of room to investigate, which is pretty fun, actually, to work on. So if this stopped spreading today, you would still work on this virus because it's we interesting. We would. Yeah. We would definitely. I mean, I, it, it's, you know, I don't know many times in someone's career when you can, that when you can start working on something that's brand new that you don't know anything about. Um, and essentially, everybody started at the same place, which was actually kind of fun. Mm. Um, you know, I'm not, comp- you know, the, the, all of the knowledge that we've gained and all the, all the F- NIH funds and, and other organizations' funds that have been funded SARS research for the past 10 years um, have really left us at a really good position to jump right onto novel coronaviruses as they emerge. And um, all of the tools and all of the reagents that we built over the last 10 years have been a, a beautiful um, foundation for us to start working on this new virus. So it's really, it, it's incredibly fun. We're having a ball in the lab um, and we're hopefully finding out some really important things for treatment and for um, future studies with this virus. So can you grow this in culture? Yes, it grows in culture. We grow it in vero cells generally for preparations. Um, we use other cell lines for uh, for various other reasons for different assays, but um, you can grow it in culture completely fine. Uh, Does it have a? It? It, yeah, I was gonna. Sorry. My exactly my question, Vincent. Can you make? Can you can you make plaques? <laughs> yes, it plaques. <laughs> nice. Uh, All right. It does plaque, so that's nice. It's they're not as so SARS plaques really beautifully. Uh, it makes these very clear, crisp plaques on Vero cells. The MERS plaques are a little bit weaker, um, but they're still plackable. You stain them neutral red, and you can see them fine. Do you have any, does it have yeah. a Does it have a fairly broad host range in culture? It does, which is actually kind of one of the interesting things about this virus. Um, initially, the receptor. You know, now this is going incredibly fast, but. When you have this virus that was initially isolated, all we knew was the genome sequence, and that was it. So um, there was several papers early on putting this virus on multiple cells when no one knew what this receptor was, uh, and to look for tropism. And it grows in um, in human cells, in bat cells, in in dog cells, um, in uh, I'm trying to think of what else. In monkey cells, uh, a really a broad spectrum of species. It's not very species specific, uh, at least in cell culture. What happens in animals? Is totally different. Quite, don't totally different story. Um, yeah. So, like, there's no animal model. Is that right? So that takes us to the next, um, the next step. Uh, it, the virus doesn't grow in mice, um, which we'll hopefully be publishing soon. Oh, you've, um, you've done that. Is that right? We did that. Yeah, that was the first thing we did. So, we, as soon as we got the virus, I had immune deficient mice ready to go, thinking that was the place we're going to go right away, mm. put it in, the, in, those, in those mice, and at least it'll grow there, and statin knockouts and interferon knockouts, and um, it doesn't grow at all. Um, and so we're trying to figure out why and, and if it's a receptor issue or not and, and how that works. But the only model that's been published where it, it, it replicates is in macaques. So in rhesus macaques, um, you can get very focal pneumonia and, and, and a reasonable uh, pneumonia response in the lungs. It replicates um, over the first six to nine days in the lungs. Um, you get lesions by um, dissection. You can see lesions of, of hemorrhage and edema in the, on the lungs. And then by uh, immunistic chemi- or by H&E staining, you can see uh, some nice inflammation and pathology. Do the macaques transmit it to each other? Those studies have not been done, as far as I know. Sorry. Does it grow on Does it grow on mouse cells in culture? We have not been able to go to mouse cells that I, uh, in our lab. I don't know if any other labs have. Um, the receptor was identified um, by. Let me get. I don't, did you guys do the receptor paper yeah. already? Yeah, we did. Yeah. So um, I just want to get the name of that group right. It was is a uh, European group. Um, there it is. Uh, with Bart Hagman's lab was the he's the last author. Um, Beren Jean, uh, Jean Bosch, uh, who I met recently at the meeting, Osterhaus, Rotier, and Drosten, Bulkerfield, Ron Fouché. They're the last six authors with Zaki. So those are all PIs essentially of these labs in in uh, uh, in Europe. And so they identified the receptor. Um, they're really nice biochemistry, basically, and showed that it's expressed. It's called DPP4 for dipeptidyl peptidase four. Um, it's involved in a lot of different things, which is actually quite interesting. Um, and it's expressed in human cells, in human airway cells, in the Clara cells, and the type 2 alveolar cells. Um, hmm. And that's interesting because the, the 
SARS receptor, which is ACE2 for angiotensin converting enzyme 2, it's expressed on ciliated epithelial cells in the airways. And in the airways, you have ciliated epithelial cells and then clara cells, which, which uh, both are, fairly, are basically next to each other uh, down your conducting airway. Um, and this virus infects the clara cells in the airway while the SARS infects the ciliated cells next to it. So, hmm. what so does anybody have that, um, human DPP-4 transgenic mice? That would be an ama- a perfect reagent, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, well, is it the receptor that uh, is restricting infection of mice? Do we know? So we don't know. Uh, that's something we're working on the lab. That's um, easy to do. Just put it in mouse cells and culture. Or if you put viral RNA into mouse cells and culture, does it replicate? Ooh, good question. So as far as I know, those experiments have not been published. All right. I better let you go so you can do this. He's got to get around <laughs> on the hall, right? Does, but SARS uh, coronavirus does not replicate in, in mice either, correct? No, it does. I thought you had to adapt it to, to do so that. So it's an interesting story. So the, um, the, the human isolate of SARS, will you can infect regular wild-type mice, balbs, B6s, 129s, with, okay. with the human isolate of SARS, and the virus grows fine. It it replicates in the lung. In seven days or so, the virus is, by, by day seven after infection, the virus is cleared. Um, you have minimal inflammation in the lung. Um, the virus, it replicates in the ciliated epithelial cells in the airways. It causes denuding bronchiolitis, so which means that it infects the ciliated cells and eventually kills them, so they get sloughed from the, in the airway. Um, and then you get repair of those cells um, uh, in the lung, and then the mouse is fine. And now the mouse is immune. Um, so it doesn't kill the mice. It doesn't cause weight loss. It doesn't cause any obvious pathology in young mice. Yeah. In old mice, it actually will cause a much more severe disease. Um, so 12-month-old mice, this is work done in Ralph Barracks lab at UNC, 12-month-old mice infected with the human isolate of SARS will um, cause, still replicate fine, but cause a much more severe pathology uh, and induces a, an acute respiratory stress syndrome, so an ARDS phenotype um, in the lungs. Uh, that is still being worked on in their lab. Hmm. Um, so, so, sorry, yeah? I was going to say, since Fouchier has the virus, he must be sticking it in ferrets, right? I, I would imagine he would. <laughs> I, I don't, I, this not, all of that data isn't published, so I probably shouldn't talk about it. But, has anybody um, tried putting it in dogs? So you mentioned it grows in dog cells, right? I believe it grows in MDC, MDCKs. As far, uh, I have to look back at the paper, but I'm pretty sure that was one of the cell lines. Mm. Woof. Yeah. Um, I'm just I, I'm just trying to you know think of a model that would be easier than macaques, which would be pretty much any model. Right. Yeah. So I mean, I think that ferrets are you know a place to go. Um, mice would clearly be a better model, um, and it, it it doesn't grow in mice. So I think a, a transgenic mouse is really the first step, um, which obviously it's something we're doing at the moment. Right. Uh, mm, cool. Um, so the other thing about the mouse adapted virus is that so since for SARS, since you since it grows. Fine in mice doesn't cause disease. What Kanta Sabara's lab at NIH did was they took the SARS isolate and passaged it blindly from lungs of the infected Balpsy mice, uh, waited two days, took the lungs out, hum- smushed them down, and then took the supernate and infected another mouse and did it again and again and again until you, um, you evolved a virus that was lethal. And so That's a familiar sounding experiment. Yes. Exactly. Very standard experiment. I think we know that well from the ferret story last year. Um, and after 15 passages, she was able to produce a virus that was lethal in 10-week-old Balpsy mice. Um, and then now, that virus. Yep. Could you? Could you? Um, has have you thought of taking um, the the unique genes from SARS, putting them into MERS-CoV, and seeing if you can get it into mice that way, modify the virus? So I think those are all very open questions. Um, there, are, there are multiple labs working on infectious clones for MERS at the moment to be able to do those experiments. Um, I think the first question is, is, is dealing with the receptor. So right. does the mouse receptor, the mouse receptor protein DP4 work for MERS? Is it in the right place? Um, is it in the mouse lung? Is it not in the mouse lung? You know, what cells are infected in people? I mean, all of these really questions are really open. Um, there, there, I mean, there's, there's no human specimens from human infected lung that have been published or released to know where the virus is actually going in human airway during a real infection. 
the experiments okay. to know that it affects Clara and type 2 alveolar cells has been done with ex vivo lung chunks from uh, autopsies or from basically um, from pathology cases where a uh, live lung can be taken out of someone from an emergency room, essentially, you know, lethal case and or biopsy. Um, and then an ex vivo infected in the VL3 with MERS and then staining to see where the virus goes. Right. I gather a, a number of the patients who've been infected and died, the families refused autopsies, right? Correct. As far as I understand. Some of these papers that uh, we'll, we'll get to in a bit suggest that uh, more virus is produced in the lower respiratory tract than the nasopharynx, which would suggest that maybe that's a major site of replication, I guess. That's, I gather that as well. Um, and, you know, again, th there needs to be more samples from more patients across this, uh, you know, the 81 patients so far um, that are infected to know really what is going on in that level. Um, and that I, would certainly be consistent with the, the limited person-to-person -person spread that we've seen. Correct. So most of the origins of infection have probably been in the Middle East. Is that correct? That's what it seems to be um, at the moment. Uh, we don't really know if it's other places as well and it's just not identified. Um, but all, everything so far seems to be that there's a, at least a, fo a focal region of Saudi Arabia with, as the primary, num primary number of infections. Um, Jordan and Qatar have had other infections as well. Um, and that seems to be the, the focus of, of what's known at the moment for where this virus is. And, they have and I gather... Oh, go, go ahead, it's okay. Uh, um, I gather within Saudi Arabia, this eastern region uh, that where the, the date palms are growing um, has been a major focus, right? Uh, yeah, that seems to be the, the, a, a big um, center for where those infections occur. Um, that's uh, you know, primarily because there's, there's a one hospital there that had a hospital person-to-person -person spread uh, cluster right. of, I think, 23 cases. Yeah, which is um, a, almost half of all the cases, right? Which was, yeah. So that was, that was a big foci of infection. Um, and several people, several epidemiologists from the U.S. and Canada went to help them deal with that, um, which is one of the papers that came out recently in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, so is, the, is the current thinking that uh, there are multiple zoonotic uh, infections that are causing this rather than a chain of human infections? It's really hard to know, but I think that's the best guess is that when you look at the sequence, so out of these 81 cases so far, there's nine genomes available mm -hmm. in GenBank. Um, but before this uh, Alasa outbreak paper, there was five. And of those five, they're actually very similar um, to each other. Uh, but it looks like clearly, the at least, you know, I, I would say it's safe to say that they are probably multiple um, environmental infections uh, yeah. to different people, um, especially because they're geographically separated from where from each other. There's, from, a, there's, there's some on the east and some on the west. There's a very nice website which you link to uh, Epidemic by mm -hmm. Andrew Rambo, and he has a nice analysis of the sequences. Uh, I guess which suggests that they these these strains, the nine strains that you referred to or the nine isolates, have a common ancestor around 2011. Right. And he says that it's consistent with multiple zoonotic uh, introductions. But the, what I, is... I really, I really like this website, and he, he has done this with great care. Yeah, he's like really the, good. I've on, talked to him by email his, a lot. On his interpretation, you know, he's very, he's very careful to say that that's, that's a speculation. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he's, he's very cautious. I really respect that. It's very good. So you know, I think that's the way to go. I mean, the really we don't have a lot of information about this virus yet, and um, until and so I'm sure we're getting there. But the environmental reservoir for this virus is completely unknown. Um, the genome of the virus make, looks like uh, several other bat coronaviruses that have been previously identified in bats in China and in Europe, um, but the reservoir in Saudi Arabia or any of these other countries is completely unidentified at the moment. But if, you know, if there's multiple uh, introductions into the human population from some uh, non-human source, it's odd, it seems to me, that it's all uh, geographically, you know, in roughly the same place and in time in roughly the same time. It's, 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 I don't know how to explain that. 
if it were one introduction, yeah, I could deal with that, okay? But multiple uh, introductions uh, in roughly the same time and place, it's as if there's, well, it's like a four corners thing in a way, okay, where there must be some sort of environmental trigger or some something going on that, uh, that allows this to happen. Is there, uh, we've probably talked about this before, but is there a seasonality to this? I mean, we've only been, we've only had the, known about this thing since September, so there yeah, hasn't right. been enough seasons to know. Yeah, yeah. But Rich, many infections have repeated zoonotic introductions. You know, Ebola is like that, Nipah. True, yes, and, okay, uh, yeah. You know, the, you, you have a source and there's continuous spillover from the source. Okay. The difference here is we don't know what the source is. Right. Um, okay. So you know, NEPA and p- date palm sap. You know, uh, right. once that was identified, they could stop that. Now, in this case, if you could find out what it is, maybe you'd help uh, limit them. But yeah, so, we've got date palms again here. So uh, Matt, the the virus um, with the greatest similarity to MERS coronavirus is a bat virus, and they have just about three hundred nucleotides of sequence from that. Correct? Uh, no, they have a full genome for the other viruses. So there's a virus called HK4 and a virus called HK5, and then uh, those are the two from China. And there's another virus in which is actually the closest um, relative, which uh, that that one actually a smaller a smaller genome. That's the several hundred bases that you you comment on, but that one's in Europe. Um, so um, so clearly, people are looking right now at bats in Saudi Arabia to find out the nearest uh, relative. But in when SARS emerged, was that a single spillover event from? Uh, a bat, or were there multiple events? So for SARS, it was a different time frame. So I don't think anyone really knows at, at early on, at least that I that I understand, um, you know, with data. Um, so when we heard about SARS for the first time, there was already several hundred cases uh, out of China mm-hmm. um, when they alerted the WHO to there being some atypical pneumonia um, in Guangdong. So we started at a much different place, and you know. Vince, you and I have talked about this before, um, whether this type of outbreak that we're seeing now with MERS is, are we only seeing it because of the new uh, genome analysis and sequencing technology where we can actually see these things occur yeah. at much earlier steps? And are there small ice outbreaks like this all the time that are just called, you know, somebody got pneumonia and they died and, you know, there's unlinked to other cases? Um, and you, now with deep sequencing, you can actually tell those things and what they are. Or is this something special that's unique and very SARS-like? And I, I don't think we know. Yeah, I think, gonna, I think 87 respiratory infections would not be noticed 10 years ago, right? Right, right. But now you got a virus out of them and you, you're paying attention. But it may be that it's background. Yeah, because right. 10 years ago, the, the isolates would have been tested for known viruses. They all would have come up negative and then you'd hit a wall. Right. Yeah. And I think cool it's interesting, thing. in in both cases, it's a clinical physician. And for SARS, it was a Dr. Urbani, um, who actually ended up dying of SARS. Um, he's the one who, who pushed the and, and contacted WHO about this virus uh, when he was in mm-hmm. Guangdong. Um, okay, and Dr. in Zaki. this case for MERS, it's this Dr. Zaki who... He fared a little better. Huh? He, yeah, well, I guess. He's um, alive. <laughs> he's yeah. alive. Um, and I think, you know, I think that really goes to show that you know, as much as we think we're super special in the lab and can do all these cool tricks with genomes and, and cell culture, it all starts at the level of uh, awareness of physicians that have to know what to look for and that and they know if something doesn't smell right. Well, just think Absolutely. of how many physicians are not aware and how many things that are being missed because of that. Sure. Tons. I, we don't know, right? That's one or of those how many patients questions. can't even get to a physician. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, one of the things that struck me is that a lot of these patients, well, there's there, a lot of them are men, a lot of them are old men, and right. many of them have underlying health issues. Correct. They're immunocompromised, or they have, they're on dialysis, and so forth. So is it, is it they're, they're sort of like the El broth for us. They're really good at picking <laughs> up infections, right? Maybe that's why we're seeing this. Absolutely. I, I think that is one of the striking features of what we know so far with these, the, the patients is that um, we don't know a lot of the comorbidities. Uh, it's, it's coming out of, of all these cases now in Saudi Arabia, but um, what we do know is that they tend to be older men um, for the more severe cases, 
and they are um, they have other comorbidities. They're they're sick, either in the hospital already or going to the hospital for some illness. Mm-hmm. Um, the the case in Al Asa where there's the the hospital outbreak, they're all almost all the patients are on dialysis, um, and whether it's you know whether it's really diabetes that's important or whether it is that they were sitting next to each other for hours, you know, a day for multiple days a week, coughing on each other is another question. I don't think that's yeah. unknown at all. Um, I mean, in many of these cases, um, lots of hospital contacts and family contacts are fine. And right. Presumably right, these, yeah, are, these right. are healthy people. They've been exposed. In, in one of these papers, they mentioned the sons of this old man, the first case, who spent hours every day next to his bed. Some of them got sick and others didn't. Right. So, and the younger cases are, you know, the close contacts, I mean, essentially to be infected with this from one, from, from an infected person to another person, there has to be close contact, Mm -hmm. um, whether it's a healthcare worker or whether it's a family member, but there's many healthcare workers and family members who are not infected. Um, So I think the transmissibility is still quite low for this virus. Um, Other than this one hospital setting where you have a chain of infection, um, the rest of the cases are, are really a much lower probability of infection from person to person. Right. So there's this one, actually three papers uh, which you put on the show notes all came out in May, June. Um, and the one I'm looking at now is New England Journal, which is hospital outbreak of, of MERS coronavirus, which is the one we've mentioned. 23 cases in a hospital in Eastern Province. 21 of the 23 cases acquired by transmission in hemodialysis units, intensive care units, or inpatient units in three different healthcare care facilities. Right. Right. So these, are, a these real, are sick patients. Very sick people. Um, There's a really cool table in that paper where they uh, trace the relationships among the infections and identify an index case. I think that's a cool figure. Right. And I think one thing important about this paper is that it's a, um, this was the first paper from this team from uh, Saudi Arabia who mm-hmm. called in help from, um, or at least epidemiologists from the U.S. and Canada. Um, right. So the, second auth- the first author is, uh, I believe, Abdullah Siri, who's the um, Saudi Arabian doctor, and then Allison McGreer, Trish Pearl, and Connie Price. Um, Allison, it, all three of them were involved in the SARS outbreak in Toronto, as far as I understand. Um, Allison is still in Toronto. Trish Pearl is here at uh, Hopkins in Baltimore as a hospital epidemiologist, and Connie Price is at UC Denver, um, uh, or sorry, Denver Health and, uh, yeah, University of Denver. Um, and so they were called in by the WHO, or sorry, by the ASTIC to, to come in from, uh, by the Saudi Arabian Ministry of Health to help them uh, figure out what was going on in this hospital where there was clearly something unusual going on. Um, so it was a nice interaction between the Saudi Arabian doctors and, um, you know, outside help when they needed it. Cool. Yeah, which I think is important. I mean, th- so we know in this case, we suspect the chain of transmission within the healthcare facilities, but we don't know where the index cases got their infections. Correct. And often, yeah. uh, often they die and you don't, you can't get any history about whether they contacted some animal. So, so Matt, there's some suggestion that camels might be involved. Is that right? Right. So there's a case in um, the there's a case in that was from the UAE where he um, this man was in, was got sick and flew himself to Germany for treatment, um, and the story <laughs> is that is is that this guy is a wealthy um, uh, uh, man who lives in, in the UAE and he, he breeds racing camels and his camel was sick. One of his camels was sick and he spent the night um, nursing the camel back to health. Um, so in close contact with this sick animal and then himself got sick. Um, and no one has ever gone back and got the camel to see what happened to the camel. As far there was a recent report uh, yesterday, the day before that said that the camel was a full better. recovery. Yeah. And a full recovery. When, and one of the interesting things in the article was that the brother of the man um, was also sick, but refused treatment and got better him, by himself. That was the first time I had seen that. Hmm. So, um, Matt, Matt, you ought to get on a plane and go over there and get that camel. Uh, yeah, we at least need some blood from the camel. Oh, you don't want him to bring the whole camel back? Well, why not? Sure. 
<laughs> so, that, although that if, it's, if it's a racing camel in the UAE, I, I suspect that would be fairly expensive to acquire. Yes, could Matt, be. if you could go there and get something from this animal, anything, what would you get? It's a long time since this happened now, right? Right. I mean, I think you would get blood and look for if the animal was zero converted or not. So yeah. do we have uh, reagents to do that right now? So they're under development. Um, there, there are ELISA kits that I know people at labs are working on to mm-hmm. try to, um, to do those type of studies where you can screen for zero prevalence of, uh, of MERS antibodies in people and in animals. That's an important assay to have out there, right? It is. It is a very important assay, and, and um, I think people are working on it. And hopefully, with the increasing availability of, of samples from Saudi Arabia and other countries, those assays can be developed further. Um, because once you have that, you can not only look at people, but you can go in animals and start to say, are these animals seropositive for a related virus, right? Right, exactly. And to go back to the camel story real quick, the, I think one of the... Um, at least I've, I read in the in the press. I'm not sure how true it is, but one of the issues with um, this environmental sampling is that camels in the Middle East um, are in, have uh, foot and mouth disease, hmm. so they have foot and mouth virus, and they have um, uh, camel pox. So those right. two viruses are not allowed in the U.S. So you can't just bring ship you know, freeze dry or, or put on dry ice samples of serum from all these camel swabs around the, mm-hmm. around the country and then bring them into the U.S. So there has to be another level of, of um, purification and um, proof that they're clean of these viruses before you can bring them in. Either that or you'd have to study them there. Or you study right. them there, which is actually probably the easiest way to go. Yeah. So would you suspect that the camel acquired... If this is true, that the man got the virus from the camel, would right. the camel have gotten it in turn from a bat? Is that one idea? I mean, I think that's one idea. The, I mean, the, the, the bat theory is, um, is based on the sequence of the virus. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, there are bats everywhere. There's, there's date palms across, in, in Al-Asa. That it's actually an, an oasis on the, on the uh, eastern province of Saudi Arabia. It's one uh, of the major, major date palm growing areas in the country, yeah. Right, and there's actually a yeah, right out right outside of um, Al Asa in uh, Hofuf. I'm not sure I'm not pronouncing it right, but um, there are caves which are actually a big tourist attraction. Um, so, why don't we explain to listeners why we're concerned about date palm sap? Yeah, you can explain it to me. <laughs> okay, do you want to do that, Matt? Uh, sure. So I, I think the the general idea is that the um, the uh, Nipa is it Nipa, right? Or yep. is it Nipa or Hendra? It's I Nipa, mix them. Nipa. Yeah. Um, it was, which is another bat originating virus, um, was spread to people via um, date palm sap, which is um, used as a food item in Indonesia. Yeah, they love um, yeah. And it's, they use it as raw date palm uh, sap for, for eating. And the bat's urine was uh, contaminating the date palm sap while it, while it drank the sap on the trees. And so that spread the virus from the urine of the bats to people. So they would, store the, they would store the sap in these villages in open containers, and then the, at night the bats would go in to drink and urinate. And so Great. a low-tech solution to prevent infections was just to cover uh, these vats. Now, I don't know if they have the same practice in this part of Saudi Arabia or not, you know. Yeah, I don't know either. Um, it's something I've been trying to figure out and, and to, you know, as much as I can get to on the internet, but I don't, um, as far as I understand, the bats have come negative so far. So, but I think all of that study, it's all that's still undergo, you know, underway now. Yeah. Uh, I think Ian Lipkin and um, Peter Dozik from EcoHealth are working together to try to figure this out. It's important to point out that if we could or someone could say this is the source, you could possibly cut back on further transmission, right? Absolutely, so and that's exactly what they did for SARS. So um, there is, there's no approved vaccine or therapeutic for SARS. The, the treatment for SARS during the epidemic or the way that they cleared the virus was by uh, uh, quarantine and, and healthcare control. So they called all the animals in the wet markets that were positive, which were uh, civet cats and bats. Mm-hmm. And for they, they called them for the wet markets. They said that you couldn't sell them or eat them in any restaurants in China. Um, and everyone that was sick got put under quarantine, um, and that essentially blocked the virus. It wasn't because we had some super awesome vaccine that was developed during the outbreak. Um, that all came later that there was all the vaccine work. 
I presume they're not going to call the um, racing camels in Saudi Arabia. No. No. I, I guess. No, I would could. think not. And I don't, I don't think you can call bats either. I don't think that's possible. No. So um, no. Is there some indication that goats are involved too? I seem to see goats all over. There's a couple stories that say that there's been sick goats um, associated with some of the patients. But really, um, from what I understand, most of the you know small um, – most of the families in Saudi Arabia, especially in these areas, they have livestock of one type or another as part of their, you know, house. Yeah, the, the eastern the eastern province of Saudi Arabia is very rural, I gather, and and it's it's date palms and and goats at the house, and I guess camels as well, right. and you know that stuff's just going to be around, and the animals get sick, and so at some rate you're going to have sick animals and sick people, and uh, they're not necessarily connected. Right. Exactly. So, Matt, of these uh, 80 some odd cases, uh, there's a lot of them that are small clusters of human transmission. Um, if you uh, sort of uh, identify each of those clusters as having a single index case, then how many different clusters, how many index cases have there been? Oh, what kind of question is that? <laughs> I mean, it's so it's not like there's, uh, it's like there's, Maybe a half a dozen or something, right? Right, it's not- exactly. Right. Well, so, that, I mean, that's the point that out of these cases, there's, I mean, other than the one case in Alasa where uh, they they did epi studies and they and and Trish found that um, the one I'm trying to find the figure now, the one patient spread it to I think six other, you know, what's the chain? One, two, three, four, five, six, six other people, you know, at the most. Um, all of the other ones are one or two person spreads at the most. Okay, so that I mean, that right. leads to the idea. One, the R naught is very low, and um, and the transmissibility of the virus in its current state is quite low. Uh, whether that's going to change, we don't know. Um, I know Vincent thinks that the virus is the virus, and if it can't transmit, a, you know, very uh, at much high levels now, then it's not going to change. Um, I would. So there may there may be as much as a couple of dozen then uh, independent uh, occurrences of this. Oh yes, uh, yes, okay. yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, there, there's there's single cases in multiple towns all over Saudi, you know, in different areas of Saudi Arabia that seem to be unconnected, at least by current knowledge. So okay. the, uh, Nipa, Nipa was a similar story too, though, right? It was it was not. Like everybody's vats of date palm uh, no, sap were right. getting contaminated, it was a limited number of events, and then you just implement a practice that interrupts the chain of transmission, and that takes right. care. And of in there, there was complicated by the fact when the index case died, then the family would take care of the body, right, and prepare it, and they had close right. contact, and it would spread the infection to them. Right. So, right. Um, and I mean, and the other part of this is that I don't know, you know, if it really is bats, bats. You know, some bats are, are have much smaller um, uh, flight distance, you know, within a given period of time mm-hmm. than others. Mm-hmm. And I don't know about the species that's in Saudi Arabia, but it, it could easily be, you know, connection from one side of the country to the other. Um, I mean, there's desert there, but there are bats as well. So, um, yeah. you know, no one, it's really amazingly an open question at the moment to really know what's going on. My sense is that SARS spread faster than this. Is that correct? Uh, or is it too early to tell? I think, I think it's too early to tell. And I, I think I, with with these situations, there there are very different times and places, and a lot of what happened with SARS was not either not detected or not reported, right? Mm-hmm. Sure. You're starting at, at the beginning of SARS when, when when the world knew about it. There was a much larger caseload, and it had spread wider than this virus has at the moment, as far as okay. as far as I can tell. Um, I think that the population dynamics in China, in Guangdong, are also much different than what's happening in Saudi Arabia, right. um, where there's, uh, you know, presumably a much denser population in Guangdong province and around China than there is in Saudi Arabia. I yeah, could be right. wrong on that, but I would assume that to be true. So there is the second paper we have here, which is worth a few comments. It's also a New England Journal article, Family Cluster of Middle East Coronavirus Infections. Right. And this is in... Um, a family. There's an elderly man with a 70 year old man with issues, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension. He went to Bahrain to get some treatment. 
And then after he returned uh, to Saudi Arabia, he got sick, uh, and eventually he died. And then, right. then the so he's considered to be the index case. And then patient two is his older son, who uh, had, was in his room a lot, I presume, and he got sick and he died. And patient three was the sixteen-year-old son of patient two. Right. <laughs> he got sick and he actually got better. Yep. And then we had patient four who was the brother of patient two and the son of patient one, right. <laughs> who also got sick, but he was discharged. And these were, so the younger guys, without the issues, recovered. And so the presumption here, now one of these guys, I think, I don't know if it's this case or another, someone participated in the slaughter of a camel. Okay, here we go. So the house, uh, the house where these people lived had a lot of people living. Twenty-eight people lived in an extended household. No animal contact. No an- no domestic animals. No pets. Uh, the only animal exposure co- occurred with patient four, who attended the slaughter of a camel on October twenty-fourth. So, right, he may have gotten a separate infection from that, and not from the old man who went to Bahrain. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. The they main- didn't. They didn't. They didn't have sequences on those viruses, did they? No. Yeah, they didn't. <clears throat> Only enough, just I mean, PCR positivity. Yeah, yeah, PCR, exactly. It, it just suddenly occurred to me with all these male patients um, in Middle Eastern countries, there, there's a very strict segregation in most of these places between men and women. Right. Mm-hmm. And that may, that may be a major factor explaining the gender skew in these cases. Well, they they say in the discussion of this paper that three women in the family had repeated face-to-face contact with the patients before hospitalization, and all the women remained well. Right. And it's the men who got sick. So there's some some sex determinant there which is elusive. No, I think that's true. And supposedly in the hospitals, the male doctors treat male patients and female treat female. Um, They're they're not in the same rooms. They're going to be in different dialysis rooms. Uh, treated different times. There's also the question of whether that I've seen in the press, but never really. I don't, I don't know how clinically how important it is, but that the women wear headscarves, um, right? And maybe that is is some type of you know, pre- yeah. you know respiratory yeah. droplet protection. Um, Probably provides some. Yeah, you'd imagine it's some level. Well, it could be. Yeah. So in the hospital, right? There is strict segregation, but maybe in the homes less so. But right. could be when the patients were in the homes, they weren't shedding enough virus yet to. Uh, to transmit it, right? Who knows? Right. And in the hospital, the men take care of the men, and that who knows? That's an interesting one. So in the discussion, they also say routine testing of all patients with severe pneumonia, pneumonia is now ongoing in Saudi Arabia. Right, exactly. And I think the, one of the other papers that I didn't put up here was uh, in the English cluster. Um, uh, I, think it was the, I think it was in England where it was... Um, uh, a father, a grandfather, and two sons. And the father gave it to the grandfather and the two sons. The father and the grandfather died. The two sons lived. Um, but I think that the, it might have been this one. I, I don't remember which case it was. But the father actually never tested, the original index person never tested positive. Hmm. It was only the yeah, three contacts yeah, yeah. did. Right, right. And so it goes back to the question of that we, that the sampling is important. What type of samples you take, whether it's throat swabs versus deep bronchial lavages. Right, um, right. And, the, and ELISAs are going to be key. I think ELISAs and, and being able to test serum from patients is going to be, you know, the development of that assay is critically important for figuring out what's going on. What so are, we also don't know at this point whether there's any such thing as an inapparent or a subclinical infection, right? Because we're just getting these diagnoses uh, from individuals who you know, come in really sick. No, we do actually know that. So there's been recent cases where they've done all of these close contact um, uh, studies where they've taken throat swabs and, and uh, samples from all the close contacts. And they've actually identified um, several, of the, several of the more recent cases in the last maybe 10 or 15 cases. Um, there's many that are asymptomatic um, uh, that have just been known, that have been tested and um, had become positive but had no symptoms at all. Ah, okay. Um, and, and generally, those are younger, not older. Okay. So there's there could be a difference between the case fatality ratio and the mortality ratio. Right. Absolutely, as yes. you've talked about extensively for H five. Yeah. Um, and we just don't know. We don't know at the moment. Yeah. You know, also worth pointing out that in addition to the respiratory symptoms that these patients have, 
Uh, some of them also have gastrointestinal symptoms. And it, was that also the case for SARS, Matt? There was. There was a, um, there was a, a GI issue as well for SARS, and, and they actually showed that SARS was shed in, 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 um, by fe- in fecal matter for many weeks after you got better. Could uh, that spread virus infection? Do we know? So the, um, there's kind of a gross story. Um, in bring, it on, the, bring it on. <laughs> in one of the hospitals in Hong, I believe it was Hong Kong, um, there, uh, or sorry, hotels in Hong Kong, there was an index patient that index case that spread it to many other people on the hotel. And what the as the, what the epi papers showed was that the uh, plumbing for the hotel was inside or at least near close near next to the ventilation shafts for all the air. And it was not exactly the highest quality plumbing and it was a bit leaky. And so while the man, I believe it was a man who was the next case, was uh, in his room uh, sick, he would go to the bathroom, the plumbing you know, through the, the toilets would leak and it was essentially aerosolized through neighboring rooms. Nice. Which is awesome. So that is how it got, the idea is how it got spread to the many other people yeah. around him. Um, but for but MERS, is, we don't know if there's for, actually virus in the uh, feces, right? I haven't seen any, fe- any fecal sample isolates, as far as I remember in the papers, but the Westchester paper uh, there, there the, we go. from Germany, um, from the Drosten lab, where they showed that in urine from their, their case for the, the, the UAE guy who went to Germany, I believe it's that, that first person with the camel, um, they have urine samples, and they've been out, be able to show viral RNA in the urine mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. So potentially there's, a, there's a, you know, an issue there as well. And that may be a link to the kidney failure that is seen in patients um, yeah. so far. Yeah. So if you are diagnosed with MERS coronavirus infection, what can be done? Nothing, right? There's Nothing. No, there's no treatment. You have to just have supportive therapy in the hospital. Well, first of all, call your, your oldest son into the room. <laughs> <laughs> so immediately get put in quarantine. Uh, put an N95 mask on and, and put yourself inside a negative pressure room. Um, no, there, there is no, there's no approved treatment at the moment. Um, uh, just palliative care. Uh, there's a, a couple of papers early on showing various uh, drugs, whether it was um, a, a paper from Rocky Mountain Labs with uh, NIID lab showed that interferon and ribavirin uh, co-treatment of cells allowed for protection in cell culture. Mm-hmm. There's a couple of other papers showing other drugs, but that's all cell culture. None of, as I know, as far as I know, um, no, 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 no other papers have been published showing that those actually work in animal models, which would only be in the CAC at the moment. Um, for SARS, was there any treatment used at all? There was a lot of different types of treatment that were used during the epidemic as it was spreading because people were kind of freaked out and needed something to do, you know, some treatment. Um, interferon was used, and interferon is really the, is the only therapeutic in animal models and in people that was shown to have any therapeutic benefit. Mm-hmm. Um, but it will, you know, pretreatment of mice or post-treatment of mice around day one or two after infection um, will uh, reduce the pathology and the virus titer um, in animal models. Could you um, could you treat uh, MERS coronavirus patients with interferon? Would that be allowed? P- potentially, uh, you, I mean, interferon has all these other side effects, especially with this kidney issue. You kind of don't want to yeah. affect the kidneys, and so um, ribavirin is also has other issues as well, a lot of side effects. And um, actually for SARS, there's several papers showing that ribavirin treatment in people and in an, a mouse model of SARS cause worse disease after infection than just SARS alone. Mm-hmm. So right. I know I don't know if ribavirin is going to be used in people. The WHO says actually not to use interferon and, and in ribavirin at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I guarantee you there are many other drugs being modeled in the lab right now to see sure, what works. Sure. Yeah, you mentioned uh, quarantine so there's the third paper that you sent us was a Lancet paper, um, two infections in uh, France. So I think one patient um, was hospitalized. He had, he lived in Dubai and went to France and got sick and was hospitalized. Right. And before they found out that he had MERS coronavirus, they put another patient in the same room, and that guy got infected. Right. And again, these two were really sick people, but... Uh, this kind of emphasizes the need for really rapid diagnostics, right? So you don't put patients in the same room. Exactly. And I, you know, they're, um, they're under development. There's many, I'm sure, labs and companies working on this. And um, 
you know, that's all ongoing at the moment. Yeah. Um, this French case is interesting because the, the index patient went to, uh, on a trip through Dubai right. and, and back again. Um, and I, I haven't seen any other stories about, I, I think that all of the other people in the tour group, um, because I, I remember reading that it was, she was some kind of tour, um, uh, have been negative, but where they went, I'm sure, uh, hopefully is under investigation, what they saw, yeah. you know, did they go on farms? Did they stay in the city? You know, I don't, you know, yeah, Dubai nothing, is a city, but there's also pretty close yeah. neighboring areas that are not, that are pretty rural. So There's nothing in the paper about that, but presumably somebody's looking at it, yeah? I would hope so, absolutely. Huh, it's interesting. So the the last thing I really want to explore is this issue, which we've just sort of mentioned. Are you still there, Rich? Yes. I've noticed Can you you've, you've been popping in and uh, out. Right? I, I dropped out for a while. Yeah. Uh, we have a little flakiness, but I'm okay. All right. <laughs> so whether the, Pay attention. whether the virus will, and this is the dominant theme in the press, whether it will acquire better human transmissibility or not. Right. And obviously no one knows the answer to the question. My feeling is if it hasn't already, it ain't going to get it. Uh, why? Why? We have well. I would base it mainly on history. Every time a virus emerges, it's ready to go in people. You know, uh, SARS emerged; it was ready to go, wasn't it? Mm, I don't think so. Tell me, tell me uh, the evidence that it acquired that ability. What were the mutations needed to transmit in people? So there's really, really nice genomic data following the SARS outbreak uh, from animal isolates all through people. And you can follow a mutational skew as it goes. And, and you, importantly, you see mutations in the spike protein, which uh, evolved during the outbreak. And, and when it went really epidemic, you can, you can see um, a more or less a fixation of, of amino acid changes in the spike protein, which of which as it evolved to be better for humans. But early on, it does, it, you know, I think there's, there's clear evidence that it, it was not optimized. Um, and this idea of virus chatter that Nathan Wolf and, uh, uh, talks about in his Ted talk and, and books where you have this, this zoonotic to human, um, uh, interaction kind of, you know, as it mutates and you get swarm of virus mutating as it replicates in, in animals. Um, you know, I think that, there's no reason to think that this is an end game of where it is now. I mean, I think that it could easily stop where it is and we'd have, you know, 81 cases right now or maybe a, a trickle of more and that's it. But, um, you know, I think you have the right person and you have the right vi virus isolate and all of a sudden you have a super spreader, which then spreads it to 10 other people who then get on a plane and, you know, two of them get on a plane to travel back to London or France or, um, you know, wherever. And but that's, I think, I think, I think you're talking about two different levels of adaptation there. Uh, SARS, when you say early in the epidemic, you mean when it had only infected several hundred people, right? Sure. So it had already made the jump to to person to person transmission, and it just got better at it. Right. Right. Whereas what we have with MERS-CoV is we've got um, in in relative terms a handful of cases, um, and there have been a couple of, of confirmed person-to-person -person transmissions, but they're very rare, and they're people who, uh, you know, very sick people next to each other in a hospital room, or people who have very close contact with the victim, and then you have know, lots of other people who aren't getting it. Um, and it's possible that that's just, maybe SARS looked like this really, really early before anybody knew what it was, um, right, and now right. we just have the techniques and, and more openness to to identify it earlier but it's also possible that this sort of thing is just uh this is what happens when pandemics don't take sure and i mean i i, I you know this is it's pure speculation to know what's going to happen um right oh sure and i think that what's at least I, I think what's clear for sars is that there was an early phase of low level spread um with people where they're the you know the 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 R was a you know a one or a one point two or the R not was was very low transmissibility, and then at some point there was some event and some mutational set in the virus um, that allowed it to spread. Um, the chances of that happening are obviously quite low. You know that the right virus has to be in the right person who allows it to go, um, and that's the the the, the question is what's going to happen. Clearly, right. the the chances of that happening are quite low. Um, so, Matt, the super spreaders 
for SARS. Do we right. understand why they are super spreaders? Not at all. Not have, as far as I know. There's no virus mutation that gives them that ability, right? Not that I've seen any any actual data for uh, mm. about what what makes them one way or the other. I mean, to me, I actually think that a virus replicating in an immunocompromised host is much scary. You know, it has a much worse potential than it in a immune competent host because an immune an immune uh, deficient host, the virus can grow at a much higher titer, I would presume, at least it does in animals, and um, and replicate. Uh, faster and without the straight the regular immune response pressures that it does at least some of the pressures that it does in immune competent host and so your swarm of mutations is much larger in immune deficient hosts um, mm -hmm. than it would you know at least potentially in a in a regular normal host in a healthy host so yeah. you know maybe spreading around a hospital is really not you know this is really a little bit worse than spreading it around in a healthy you know twenty two year old um, you know college student. You know, given global travel, would you be surprised that the virus has not been introduced into the U.S. yet? I'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole. Why, why, <laughs> why? Not, you, you think you might not get tenured if you answer that? <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll, I think that that is always a concern. Um, no one knows what's going to happen. Um, the chances are that that could happen. It, you know, the chances are that it could not. It, it really... Um, there really is no way to know, but I think that with yeah. global travel, that is the worry. That is what the worry that's going to happen is that it's going to, you know, go around the world, you know, and it, it doesn't take that many people to really cause a large, um, a large problem in many countries. Um, I mean, it, I, I would guess that it's been here already, and it just hasn't gone anywhere. That would be my guess, and that that's why I feel, in, in part, that this virus isn't ready for prime time. Well, so what I would like to know, actually, and, and what we've worked on before and we're trying to get more funding for is, is to do surveillance of bats and, and of animals in the U.S. Mm -hmm. to see what viruses are really here and are there coronavirus that look like this virus or in the similar families in the U.S. already. Um, Didn't you do some of that with... Uh so we did that with no. Eric Donaldson yeah. um, and Ed Gates, uh, who was our bat guy at University of Maryland right. uh, College of Animal Sciences in Western Maryland. And we looked for bats... Um, well, we looked in bat samples from from bats that were that live in Western Maryland and you know the surrounding areas. Um, then we found the novel coronavirus. It's from a different a different group than SARS and MERS, mm -hmm. um, and we're trying to get funding to do that again to see uh, uh, where what viruses are really there and how they change over time, and uh, to go deeper and and do with, with the new sequencing methods, we can get much deeper analysis than we could before. Um, and so I think it's going to be. I hopefully we'll be able to get. We'll be to look for that and get funding to be able to study those type of questions. Now so I forget. I forget that screening was done with a an unbiased sequencing approach. Is that right? So, right. if this or a similar virus were there in any significant quantity, you could have picked it up. Exactly. It was a total RNA from fecal samples. Okay. Now is the time to write that grant application. It went in Monday. Yeah, because the politicians are you know, <laughs> scared of this thing, so you better. I think it's a great thing to do. I, I, I think you might find some interesting stuff, but it's a tough climate. And if this virus quiets down, it'll be harder. Yeah, it was part of a bigger grant, which hopefully, uh, you know, everybody else has good, had good ideas as well for their part of the grant. So, I, you know, potentially there's a chance. But I think that, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. you know, I think we're going to push that again for other, and other types of funding mechanisms because I think it's really interesting. And, and you know, it's hard to get funding for completely open-ended research. You know, you don't know what you're going to find, so you can only predict um, uh, what viruses are there. But uh, we're always going to find something interesting. Yep. But I just don't know what it is. I agree. Um, it, but, but the big question for that research is, is, are the viruses that you find able to infect humans or not? Right? That's right. ultimately what you want, to say, is there a virus there that if it came in contact with the wrong person could cause them a disease? How would you and know that? So, how would you do it? What do you think? Uh, you volunteering to be infected? No. <laughs> well, you could just see if it infects human cells right off the bat, right? Right, but uh, I think right only one, bat, or, yes. one or two bad viruses have ever been isolated <laughs> from fecal samples. I'm sorry, I, I was laughing at... Uh, would say that again, Matt. No, uh, so I said that, that isolating virus from fecal samples is quite difficult, actually, unless they're incredibly fresh. From um, bats, you mean? From bats, yeah. Yeah. 
So, uh, I mean, I think that, that with the sequencing, there's a possibility to, to synthesize those viruses in the lab. Yeah, that's hard um, though, right? Or, to, well, you know, for coronaviruses, we can definitely do it. Um, that's yeah, but possible. you want to be looking at lots of isolates and to put together a 30 kilobase genome is, it's a lot of work. Right. right. So the other, the way that we propose to do it, hopefully no one steals the idea, not that it's that novel, but um, is to do pseudotypes. So you take, a, you make a virus that you can then pseudotype the spike protein from hopefully multiple, many, many isolates that we find in these samples. Okay. And then look to see, does that virus infect bat cells or human cells? And, you know, as the first evidence that there is a possibility of, of uh, potential transmission of that virus. Yeah. That's, that's and I love, good. I love the idea. Every, I mean, I love, I, I, I the bat, virus story I think is incredibly interesting I would really love to be able to do those studies and hopefully NIH will uh, oblige it's driving Matt Batty yeah. I want to do it it's such a good good story and it's such an interesting virology question it's such an interesting public health question um, and it would really be incredibly fun to do in the lab and, you know, we only like to do fun experiments so um, I think it would be great if we could get it you must have seen the Lipkin study that we discussed recently on TWIV where they they looked in bats for, for viruses as well. Right. Um, they, all over the world, in fact. Right. And they found some... They, they didn't actually look for coronas, I think. They didn't find many, but they found other viruses as well. Yeah, I mean, I think any... You know, for the corona story, any place that people have looked for coronaviruses in bats, they have found them. They, they, they looked at hepaces and peggy viruses. That's right. That was okay. that story, yeah. It was, it was directed or sequencing or... It was, I mean, it was a directed PCR or was it... Mass sequencing. I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember. I just know the title of the paper was Peggy and uh, Hepasi viruses in bats. Yeah, that might have been just a bigger story out of the story. There were analysis. two papers. One was Peggy and Hepasis, and the other one was, uh, I think, an unbiased approach, which I'm going to look up as you're chatting now because I, I don't want to leave it at this. Go ahead. What were you going to say? No, I was going to, I, what I was going to say is that, the, that every place that people look for coronaviruses in bats, they have found them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Col- there was a study in Colorado by Kay Holmes. There was a study in Canada. Um, Kristen Drossen's group in Germany has done this throughout Europe. Um, the virus has been found in, for the progenitor virus for SARS was found in Hong Kong. And actually, just recent paper in uh, the EID journal from CDC showed that in 2011, they did sampling in Hong Kong in the same caves in, in, uh, in China, and they found another, they found a similar SARS progenitor virus there. So it's still around. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I, you know, every, you know, I, there's something weird going on with bats, um, and no one really understands what the biology is of how these viruses are there, how they don't kill the bats, how they've evolved. Because um, they're vampires. No, they're, most of them are fruit and insect eating. Really? Yes. Yeah. So here's the paper. Um, they, they looked in bat sera. They had sera from various okay. uh, bats, and they used uh, unbiased sequencing. But in this paper, they discussed the Peggy and Hepasi viruses, but they told us on TWIV that they had many other viruses that well, I guess they're going to publish elsewhere, but this paper focused on those. So that's that. Okay. We should get all the spikes and make pseudotypes. be very interesting. Call up Ian. Go ahead. All right. I, my colleagues are quiet, so I sense that we have exhausted this topic. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. I love it. No, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's great stuff. Um, should we do a couple of emails? Or do you want to stop here? Uh, uh, we're up to almost an hour and a half. I've, can we just do one or two emails? Or yeah, let's it, it gets into a whole bunch of follow-up, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, we could do... Yeah. Um, how about... Uh, let's do three. How's that? Three sounds good. I have to say, the twists have gotten longer and longer. I used to be able to listen to them on my drive home, and now it takes two or three days for me to get through them. We, we do <laughs> try to aim for about an hour and a half, but sometimes it's tough. Hmm. Well, you got to move farther away. I no, I live far enough. You still listen? I do. Because I figured as you got more famous, you would stop listening. I have no fame, trust me. I don't know. You're on Twiv seven times, man. Hey, Rich, can you take that first one? Sure. Dear members of the Twividae family, Twividae, uh, that's a, I guess, a species name? No, it's a family genus. Name. Family name. Family name? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, Twividae family, of course. In the last episode, Dr. Michael Emmerman said that when he is asked about the cellular functions of antiviral restriction factors like 
Apoback and Tetherin? The answer is that this is what they essentially do and nothing else. Or at least this is what I understood from what he said. During my, uh, the course of my master's program, I have worked for a short period on the interaction between HSV-1 and the restriction factor tetherin, also called CD317 or sometimes BST2. Tetherin is famously known for physically tethering enveloped virus particles to cellular membranes at the stage of virus release to prevent their further spread and infecting other cells. But it was also found that tetherin is the ligand for the orphan receptor ILT7, which should no longer be called orphan, on plasmacytoid dendritic cells, uh, the main interferon-producing immune cells. The interaction between tetherin and ILT7 leads to dampening the interferon, dampening interferon production by uh, plasmacy, uh, plasmacytoid dendritic cells, which seems to be a negative feedback loop to control infection production from these cells. So, it seems that such antiviral proteins still have unknown cellular functions to be discovered. For me, it was safer to say that up till now, this is the known function of these antiviral proteins, and still finding their roles in cellular processes is pending. Now I'm released and my chest is clear. <laughs> Maybe he means relieved. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> Yeah. Think, yeah. Uh, keep up the good work. Uh, let me see. There's a footnote here to a part of the th uh, thing. Regulation of TLR79 responses in plasmas. Oh, that's um, mm -hmm. it's a reference to a paper that he cites by right. Cow et al. Uh, 2009. Uh, P.S. The weather in Egypt is, as always, uh, sunny. Uh, as always, sunny, nice, but these days, politically hot. <laughs> hey, I, uh, I, I should I do it? I think he's right. That I was surprised that Michael said these proteins are there just for antiviral defense. I suspect that many of them have other things, too. That they're right. Up to. what, what do you think? That's the way I always uh, felt. But then the, then the retrovirologist came along and called them restriction factors and said these are here to combat retrovirus infections. But... I bet they have well, other fun. Well, yeah, I mean that's what the that's what the retrovirologists called them because that's what they discovered about them. It's yeah, like yeah. it's like the poliovirus receptor, right? That's you know, right. it's called that because that's how it was first found. But of course, it had you know has other functions. Um, and yeah, it's uh, I I would agree completely that you you can't definitively say this protein is for this and only this. Because we just don't know that. And yeah, by the way, yeah. um, I don't know if you said the letter writer's name is Ebrahim. Right. Ah, right. Right. And I, I so, think that the, the other thing that's known about this tetherin is there's a recent paper where they showed that um, BSC2 or tetherin expression actually induced NF kappa B. And they, they were, their idea was that it was a sensor for, mm -hmm. um, for induction of antivirals. So, um, but that may be why, I mean, the other side of it is that maybe why viruses um, interfere with this protein is because uh, it is able to signal the cell that there's virus there. Um, right. And the weird thing is that th most of these viruses work at, as, at the exit of virions, from what I understand. So um, the, the cell already knows the virus is there by that point. Um, so I don't know, you know what that means, but uh, I think, it, I mean... I would. It would be a shame to. Uh, you know, I, I don't think you could say that this is the only thing it does. It probably does other things. We just, you know, yeah, aren't smart yeah, enough yeah. to figure it out yet. Uh, well, let's save his pick till later. Okay. Uh, Alan, could you take the next one? Sure. Basil writes, "Dear Doctor Reckonello, I'm grateful re for reading my email and picking my pick of the week. I'm honored." I agree that we don't know all the ways a virus might get into a germline cell, but we can surely detect it with high sensitivity, and I think that's what matters from a regulatory perspective. I'm also glad that more picks on gene therapy have been discussed in the past few episodes since the time I wrote my email back at episode 227. I believe that more breakthroughs and innovations are coming our way with viral vector gene therapies. Thank you for discussing my comments. I look forward to contributing more on the show. All right. Thank you, cool. Basel. Thank you, Basel. And the last one is from Catherine, who writes, I hope I'm in before the deadline. <laughs> deadline is to get a follow-up, but we skipped... We're skipping a bunch of follow-ups. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, everybody. We said last week was was it Virology 101. We didn't do any yes. follow-up. Right. First, the Psych Science article 
that was the article on um, give, showing people nasty pictures and then looking at right. their, Picture, uh, their pictures of sick people and looking at their uh, cytokine yeah. level. Right. Not the best journal. I'd call it more a magazine for the American Psychology Society. So yeah, not the best research articles, but some interesting reads if one takes them with a large grain of salt. The Wimmer Labs article. I wonder if you move into a ferret model and then make de-optimized H1N1 and H5N1, then test the reverse, also challenging the version with the flu of origin. So do H1N1 test H5N1 test H1N1 and vice versa. Added right. bonus for challenging with previous pandemic strains. Um, so I suppose you could do that. The thing is that apparently... Um, uh, H1N1 gives you some cross protection against H3N2. And this was pointed out over on facebook.com slash This Week in Virology, where the Wimmer paper uh, led to a very large discussion about it. Um, so, this cross protection between H1N1 and H3N2 is apparently well known. So, I'm not sure that doing the H5, H1. Business. Although I must say that I think Fouché published that uh, immunizing with H1N1 ferrets anyway protected them somewhat against H5N1. Right. I think that was in that in the the passage study, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And they didn't understand it, but there may be some cross-reactive antibodies there. So that's not a bad idea. Finally, dumb question alert. I hear over and over about toll-like receptors. The use of like. Says to me there are receptors, important ones, I presume, called toll. Have I gone off my rocker? <laughs> now, if you go way back in TWIV, we talked about the origin of toll-like receptors. The toll gene was first discovered in Drosophila as a gene that control development pattern formation by uh, Christian, what's the name? Null, uh, Nusslein Volhard. Thank you. And yes. Eric Wieschaus, right. who got the Nobel Prize for that. Yep. And then when they were then discovered in mammals, they were called toll-like receptors. See, that's why it's good to fund basic biology, because you never know where you're going to go with it. Absolutely. Right. Right. Absolutely. Man, there's so many examples like that. Actually, a bunch of, bunch of genes from fruit flies that uh, we got an initial inkling of from flies or, or zebrafish or something like that. and that right. Yeast. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. All, the, you know, all these sensors, all these toll-like receptor genes in mammals, which are sensors of uh, infection, we we might not have seen them until many years later if we hadn't picked them up in flies first. The trouble with the trouble with the fly genes is you have to rename them when you find them in humans, because <laughs> most of them have really silly names. There's a yeah. tradition in that field, and you you can't name a human gene something like Sonic Hedgehog because right. you know you you don't want to tell a patient that that's yeah. It's In the case of toll, of course, toll, T O L L, is a German expression for, you know, wow, crazy, far out. Really? Is, I didn't know that. Which is apparently what uh, she said, Christian. Um, Just line full heart. Thank you. <laughs> what she said when Eric showed her the phenotype of the flies. She said, toll. And that was the name of the gene. That's good. I like that. Yeah. And finally, and for the record, I'm listening to Vince's iTunes course in preparation for the online course this summer. I hope I make it. All right. What's the development of your uh, the course? Uh, so we're just channeling my uh, lectures onto Coursera. Mm -hmm. But to do that, you have to make modifications. You've got to break them up into small chunks. Uh, you can put questions in the video. You can embed questions. So, you know, you... you talk about something and then immediately ask them a question which they can answer so that's cool you can do online exams uh, discussions and so Coursera has lots of uh, extra stuff that iTunes doesn't have so Columbia's trying it out and I'm their test uh, test driver I guess I think it's great For the, let's see by the way the weather in Korea at the moment is the sun is rising behind clouds and 63 degrees Fahrenheit Okay, so I said three, and that's three. Okay. And we have lots more left, but we'll, oh, yeah. we'll get to those next time. All right, let's do some picks of the week, and let us start with the coronavirus expert, Matt. <laughs> All I do is work on them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so my pick, so I have a, a, a 
recently turned four year old and one year old, and um, I found a website called The Kid Should See This, which is a um, collection, a rolling collection of videos um, that were about all kinds of science and biology and, and engineering and all kinds of videos um, about you know everything um, that are actually incredibly informative and are great for little kids. And so I play them all the time for my daughter um, and she loves them. So if anybody out there has kids and is a scientist, go and uh, take a look. Mm. This is great. I know. This is cool. Very cool. Lots of good I, stuff. Uh, I, watched, I watched the one on the dominoes. Isn't that great? Yes. Uh, uh, very good. Very good. Yeah, nice. That's very nice. This is, we should have you back uh, more often as your kids are young. Because when they get older, you're not going to have this stuff anymore. <laughs> Obviously, you have other stuff which we can't mention on Twiv. Right. Well, that, my daughter is, you know, quite the budding scientist. She likes kind of, you know, she's four, so That's good. she's not scared of bugs and dirt and everything. So she's uh, gets she'll, in everything. She'll get over it. I introduced her to. Um, <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully not. I introduced her to uh, um, uh, cornstarch and water. Yeah. 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 Have you ever played with that recently? I haven't played with it since I was a kid. But if you make a good solution and um, you grab in your hand really tight and it gets really hard. And then you open your hand up, and then it melts away and drips down again. So it's this non-Newtonian liquid. Cool. Um, Black. Which is totally awesome. So she, yeah, was, yeah. she spent a good half an hour with, you know, playing with that, which was great. Nice. Rich Condit, what do you have for us? I gave a preview to this last time when I was talking about the book To Catch a Virus. And I quizzed you guys on who discovered mm -hmm. negative staining in electron microscopy, and that was Sidney, Sidney Brenner. In the, in the process of reading that book and that kind of stuff, I just looked to see if I could find out more about this, and up popped a website called Web of Stories uh, that I'm surprised we haven't picked before. It's a website where, uh, actually, they started off by uh, recording uh, uh, video interviews uh, and stories with famous scientists and other personages and now anybody can put on their story but they must they've got they must have a couple of hours of Sidney Brenner a long interview chopped up into bits and you can find all kinds of other stuff but just as a demonstration I picked this one little thing that's about five minutes long that's Sidney uh, describing how he uh, discovered negative staining and or develop negative staining in electron microscopy and, um, uh, you know, what it's good for. Hmm. So it's pretty good because he's an entertaining good. individual. So, so I just searched for Matt Freeman, you know, to see if he's in here. <laughs> I came up with four results, all Matt Meselson. Uh, so I guess you aren't famous. It's all so you, Matt Meselson's <laughs> got interviews there. Yeah, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of cool people on the site. It would be fun to watch. Well, we'll come to... Uh, to Baltimore and, and record an interview with you, Matt, and put it up here because you should be here. <laughs> Good idea. I'll, I'll, my fame will, if my fame ends with being on uh, Twiv for seven times, I'll be happy. <laughs> Alan, what do you have for us? Uh, I have something to put on your calendar on July 19th. Um, well, you don't actually have to put it on your calendar. You could probably just hear about it after they do this. But uh, NASA's Cassini probe is going to be taking a picture. It's taking pictures all the time. This one is actually going to be, um, uh, you'll be able to see Earth on it. Hmm. And uh, the probe is around Saturn. So this is one of the most distant, this will be one of the most distant photos ever taken of the Earth. And it should be really, really cool. Uh, there's one other like this, uh, it's called the pale, do pale blue dot picture. Right. Uh, which was taken by Voyager or Pioneer? I think Voyager. Voyager, as it was at, way, way out after it had left uh, the orbit of Pluto, I think it, it looked back and took a picture, and, um, and and there's just this little tiny blue dot that's, that's the Earth, um, which is pretty mind-blowing if you look at it. Uh, so NASA is now doing this with a much higher resolution camera, um, and I think it's going to be a really cool picture. And so on July nineteenth, you should you should look up at the sky and, and wave. Um, <laughs> I'll do I'll do that. Yeah, good idea. yeah. Tw at twenty one twenty seven UTC. Uh, so and how long afterwards it. will we get the image? Do you know? They should have it probably probably the same day. Neat. I, well. Actually, no. It'll take uh, no. I I take that back. It's going to take them. It'll take them time because this thing has to 
send its files back over a very narrow pipe. So it, it may thought, be yeah. it may be a few days before they mm, cool. Well, it's going to be a, it's going to be a little dot again, isn't it? Or it's going to be yeah, a- yeah, but it's going to be juxtaposed <laughs> right next to Saturn with the rings and. Oh, that'd be cool. I think it's going to look really cool. One point four four billion kilometers away. Yes. Yeah, it's a long ways, isn't it? That's a long ways. All right, <clears throat> my pick is a is a little YouTube video made by my daughter called Cockroaches. This is great. It's very good. She made it for her biology class. She is not. Uh, planning a career in science, oh! <coughs> but um, she did do this for her class, and I thought she did a very nice job. She, you know, wrote it and uh, animated it and uh, recorded it all on her own, and so I thought it was cool. And check it out; it's very short. Do you have like permission it. to release this, Vince? Uh, no, but it's on, <laughs> it's on YouTube. What the hell, right? Did you, did you tell her that you were putting this on the show? Oh yeah, my daughter is cool. No okay. problem. She's fine. She likes fame. Um, well, she's going to get the twiff bump now. You know, it's the, her yeah. biology teacher has a YouTube channel. It's public, so uh, it's, you but know. Right now, she's at 36 views. We'll see how much we can get. I bet she gets a couple of hundred out of this, yeah. All right, our listener pick of the week is from Ibrahim, and <clears throat> he writes, uh, I have a pick I would be amazed if it was not picked before. It's a book called Virus Hunter, 30 Years of Battling Hot Viruses Around the World. It's an amazing book that I received as a gift the day I defended my thesis. It's a great and inspirational book for all those who would consider field work with viruses and epidemiology, written by the man who was deeply immersed in such activities for years and years, as stated on the book cover, quote, the commander of the Army Virology Unit that battled Ebola in the hot zone and current director of special pathogens at the CDC teams up with the best-selling co-author of Mindhunter to chronicle his extraordinary 30-year career fighting deadly viruses. I presume this is C.J. Peters, right? It is, yes. yes. I don't know if we've picked it. doesn't ring a bell. doesn't ring a bell. As a pick, that is. But uh, No. Thanks. That's a good pick, Ibrahim. It is. Thank you very much. And that will do it for TWIV 239. We're getting up there in numbers. Yeah. Pretty soon we'll reach 300. I, mean, I don't know how we can top 200. Or 100. We'll think of something. I mean, we'll come up with something. 100 yeah. was cool. We could interview somebody who's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe by then they'll have a, a zombie virus and we'll figure that's not, out. That's not far away. We'll figure out something for number 300, but we have some time. We have some time. Yeah. Uh, you can find Twiv at iTunes and at twiv.tv. And if you like us, consider subscribing over at iTunes and uh, leave a rating there. That helps to keep us visible so that more people can find us. And we do love to get your questions and comments. Send them to twiv at twiv.tv. We are way behind, but we will catch up sometime. Maybe in time for 300. Maybe. <laughs> right. The last, the last 50 will just be straight email. We'll have to do uh, another all email. And uh, uh, no, no twiv next week, right? Better warn people of that. Yeah, I think we ought to take the, you gonna- the fifth off. Uh, yeah. I mean, I do I have we'll take a... The fifth. I take the fifth. I do have an episode in the can. Ah, okay. Which I recorded in Vermont. I, I thought might, you recorded it in the can. No, oh, wow, that would be really <laughs> gruesome to take a word from Matt Freeman. Um, I might post that if, okay. You, but I'm not sure yet. I, I have to go and check out how it turned out. So uh, if nothing shows up, listeners, don't panic. Yeah, don't panic. We're just taking the week off. Matt Freeman is at the University of Maryland in Baltimore, where he has the MERS coronavirus. And uh, we're looking forward to that first paper. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. That was really good. I, I really enjoyed it. I think we went into it in, in the depth that no news source will ever do. Yep. Would you agree? I, I came, up with, came up with several dozen experiments for Matt. He probably already thought of them, but get back to work, Matt. <laughs> in fact, I think journalists who are writing about MERS coronavirus should listen to this episode because there are lots of good questions and some answers, but not all. Right. right. It's, I think it's hard to write about They should about interview this, Matt, who is the foremost expert on coronavirus. Please, right. you're going to get me in so much trouble. <laughs> Matt, I sent you to that that guy in, in Russia, that radio guy. How did that turn out? Oh, did you listen? It was good. No, I, I did. It I was, never go. Do you have a link to it or something? Uh, yeah, I'll send you the link. It was me and David Quammen was on. You missed talking to David. Oh, how cool. It was great. 
That I would feel be like great. that's kind of that's my fame right there. I get to talk to so, you. Can you put the link in the show notes? Yeah, sure. So you got it. I'll put it in. We'll put it up. That's cool. Good. It's Good. a shorter version of what we just talked about, basically. Well, I, I thought you uh, should do that. Uh, anyway, good. Uh, Alan Dove is at alandove.com and also on Twitter. Thanks for joining us today, Alan. Always a pleasure. And Rich Condit is usually at the University of Florida, Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Enjoy your time. sailing. I shall. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back in two weeks. Another TWIV is viral. Uh, which title are we going with? Ah, yes. Thank you. Title. <laughs> I like the first one. I don't like, I think all the craziness about FU is bad. I like the first one. Yeah, a lot of people are sad that we stopped. <laughs> I don't know. FU and the camel you rode in on? I want to put that on my CV. <laughs> <laughs> follow up. We didn't do that much follow up, though. Yeah, no, we, we didn't, didn't do, do much, much follow up. You originally had F U in the MERS you wrote in on. Yeah, then I saw the camel story. What's the, that? What was MERS? Just a reference to the virus. Just a, yeah, just a reference to the virus. <sighs> I know what you mean, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, we. I don't know what would happen if we did that. F U in the camel you wrote in on. <laughs> What's going to happen? I don't know. Uh, I'd like. I like the ones. Uh, I'd walk a mile to infect a camel, or I'd walk a mile for a MERS. Filterable camels is pretty good. That's a little more subtle. It is very subtle. Uh, yeah. Filterable camels. That's good. I like that too. What do you like, Alan? I, I kind of like. I'm kind of proud of filterable camels myself. <laughs> but, uh, I can see. I, I see the temptation to go. I, I mean, f you and the camel you rode in on is. is, is uh, but I think filterable camels would be at least uh, would avoid the controversy of f you yeah. and. No point in asking for it, really. Yeah, I think let's do that.